It can take just 15 minutes for somebody to take your mobile phone number from you. And that is a gateway to a whole bunch of other accounts. So yes, you should be afraid, but not so afraid because we've got Tegan Jones from Gizmodo here and Jeremy Kirk, who's an editor with Information Security Media Group, who has written an incredible story about just how widespread this is and how it works. Um, I knew that people could take my identity and it keeps me up at night, but I didn't realize that it was so easy to take my mobile phone number from me. How does it work? Uh, basically, criminals are taking advantage of how easy it is to port your phone number. So, um, you know, since mobile phones kind of came to prominence about 20 years ago, the government told mobile operators, we want you to enable a system to be able to move your phone number quickly to another operator. And so that was designed to prevent operators from saying, if you want to switch to us, you have to change your phone number. So now they have a porting process, which is really quick. It takes like as little as 15 minutes, most ports are completed in like three hours. The problem is it takes just very basic personal information to be able to port a number. So you need a name, you need an address, you need like a reference number, you need the mobile phone number, and also like an account number. What's the reference number? Uh, it's just like your account number. Okay, right. So depending on the, the type of account. And so what you can do, so if I bought like a new SIM and I wanted to move my number from another provider, I'd activate that SIM, I put in my personal data, and that number would move. But because this is just such basic personal data, it's easily obtainable now in the era of these big data breaches. Mm -hmm. And so the only bit of information that's kind of slightly difficult is possibly the account number. So, I mean, I could call a mobile operator, pretend I'm you and say, you know, I really just need my account number because uh, for my expenses for the ABC. And I get that account number and like at one o'clock in the morning on Sunday morning, you can go to a website, type in the personal information and your phone number will come to me in three hours. And the reason why they're doing this is because the phone number is the last piece of critical information to perform a whole variety of frauds. Mm. So most banks use a one-time passcode to add new payees to an account or do a large transaction. So uh, many of these criminals already have like sort of the login details for your bank account. The last thing that they need is the phone number to get that code. And that's what's happening. And I spoke to several people one poor woman, this happened to her four times in 18 months. Why and another four guy, times? How, how, she was repeatedly targeted. I don't want to like victim shame here, but that just it, seems like a large number of times. Yeah, and I talked to another guy, it happened to him twice in four days. And um, I spoke with the New South Wales police and they said a lot, most of these people are victims of identity theft. Like somebody's stealing their post and has most of the information they need, just the phone numbers, like the last component of it. If you're still getting paper bills, you can mm -hmm. just steal one of those, open up the account numbers at the top. Yeah. And so often when you... Um, have an account these days for anything, they say, you should have two-factor authentication, which basically right. means that, you know, if something goes awry, if you want to change your password, you end up having it texted to you. So mm. having access to that person's number suddenly opens up so many doors, doesn't it, Jeremy? It's an extremely personal thing, your phone number. And, you know, one thing to look at is the banking fraud, of course. You know, I think any of us who lost suddenly, say, $1,500 out of the bank account, that would pose like an immediate problem, you know, by lunchtime. Um, but your phone number is also tied to a range of other online accounts. So like Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, all of them will use the mobile channel depending on how your account is configured for password resets. So there's the potential, obviously, to lose money, but there's also the potential to take over a whole lot of your online accounts. Mm. In terms of like when you started investigating how the process actually worked, mm -hmm. what didn't you expect? To be clear, this problem has been around for a very long time. And what I decided to look into uh, is had it increased in Australia. And certainly the New South Wales police are very frustrated with this because they say many of the identity theft schemes these days involve unauthorized port. Um, also, ID Care, which is a Queensland-based charity that helps people recover from identity theft, started tracking this because they were getting so many calls that this was a problem. And both of those New South Wales police and ID Care have gone to the mobile operators and said, can you do something about this? And right now, there appears to be very little effort on the part of the mobile operators to ensure that the person requesting a phone number to move is that actual person. What would stop this from happening more? Yeah, well, the mobile operators really need to kind of carry this. And um, there's a very easy fix that they could do. So for example, if you request a number port, 
they should send you a code back that you have to relay to them before the number moves. The problem right now is that if I put in Tekin's information- Please um, don't. Just <laughs> and try to move her number, that porting process starts immediately. She will get a text from the new receiving provider saying, hey, welcome to us, You know, thanks for having an account. But if she doesn't see that text message within three hours, the phone number's gone. And then she has to get it back. And in the meantime- That's why you do it at one o'clock in the morning. Yeah, that's yeah. why you do it at one o'clock in the morning. And in the meantime, the fraudsters immediately go to work as soon as they get that and the money starts disappearing. But it doesn't seem like on a technical level, like that would present huge challenges to these big organizations. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, Yeah, <laughs> it seems trivial. And the banks have actually also approached the mobile operators to say, hey, you know, you need to change this because we have to deal with the fraud cleanup. Now, uh, the mobile industry has said, well, banks, you shouldn't be sending these codes over SMS because that's long been recognized as an insecure channel. I mean, some banks are now generating the code within an app. And so it's not going over SMS. And so that is one way to uh, help kind of reduce that risk. But the banks want changes as well. The last month I've been having a whole all deal where I didn't have a new bank card. It wasn't sent out to me, fine, but I've learned how difficult it is to live without it and even just getting cardless cash. Like, yes, part of it's in the app, but part of it is texted to me as well. Yes. So the second yes. they have my account information, I'm done. All right, you can read Jeremy's story right now. It is online. Also, we have lots more to discuss in the podcast of Download This Show. It is available right now on whichever podcasting app you choose to peruse. My name is Mark Fennell. A very big thank you to Jeremy Kirk and Tegan Jones, and we'll catch you next week. 